Shalom, everybody. Welcome to this week's journey through Torah. We are almost done with the book of Leviticus. We've got two more parts to cover, uh, Bahar and then Bahukotai. This week we're going to cover Bahar. Bahar means in the mountain. Some translate on the mountain, but that would be Bahar, you know, in the mountains we're looking at. So, I mean, just a different, different things going on there. But the point is that these things are happening at Sinai. So again, what's the point of what, what, what does that matter that these are happening at Sinai? Well, this is part of what Yahweh had given to his people for their life when they went into the land of promise that how they were to live with one another in a place of uh, working together in a place of showing the heart of the father to not just the people within the nation, but the people outside the nation as well, that they're examples for people to follow. And all this was declared at Sinai. In other words, the decision to do what was right when they go into the land had to be made before they go into the land. It's not like uh, you can decide to do something after the fact or like in the heat of the de- in the heat of the moment, you have to make a rash decision, right? That's not what Yahweh is asking us to do. He's asking us to make a decision of covenant to follow him, to listen to him, and then the outcome. See, and uh, throughout the Torah, we find things like this, kind of like in, in Deuteronomy, Akev, the Parsha Akev. It's because you do these things that I am giving you, these blessings will happen. See, it's not like we do things to get the blessing, but because we're doing these things, there's blessing that follows it. See, so the decision to do something has to be made beforehand, and then there's blessing that comes along with that. Yahweh blesses, yes, we're going to do this, and then we do it, and we follow through with it, even if it doesn't make sense to us. And we'll find something in here this year. It doesn't make sense. We're going to talk about the Shemitah year and um, and, and being a, a redeemer and how this happens. Um, it doesn't make sense. It, 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 to the natural mind, it just doesn't make sense. And, and what we consider the laws of nature, it doesn't make sense. But yet, Yahweh decreed something. And if we are in covenant relationship with him and we follow him and we make that decision, we will follow him. There's things that are going to happen we might not be able to explain. Okay? So let's take a look at it. Leviticus 25.1. And I said to Moshe on Mount Sinai. Um, So this again, this is on Sinai. When Yahweh spoke to Moshe, these things were brought from the mountain to be received in faith, then walked out. Like we said, the decision to be faithful had to be made, had to be made before the opportunity of a test. <laughs> Do we follow Yahweh because of our relationship with Yahweh, or are we just following Yahweh because of what we think He can do for us, or how He can better our lives, or just because He makes me feel good? <laughs> hmm. In knowing God, Larry Crabb writes this: feeling better has become more important than finding God. As a result. Many happily camp on biblical ideas that help them feel loved and accepted, and they pass over scriptures that call them to higher ground. It's like, I serve God because I just want to feel better. I don't serve Yahweh because I love him, because I'm in relationship with him, therefore I want to walk with him, because he redeemed me, therefore I'm his. No, I just want to feel better. Hmm. He continues. Until our passion for finding God is deeper than any other passion, we will arrange our lives according to our taste, not God's. As long as we're living for ourself, we're not really serving God. And so the reason why we're serving him, is it because we get something from him? Then we're still serving ourselves, really. Why are we serving him? We have to make the decision to honor him and walk in his ways even when it doesn't make sense, and even when we think that's going to be hard, that's going to be difficult, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do it. See? And these are some of the things that we see here. So we come to things like this, Leviticus 25, 1 through 7. And when I said to Moshe, I'm out Sinai. Speak to B'nai Israel and tell them, when you come into the land which I give you, the land is to keep a Shabbat to Adonai. See that? The land itself is to keep a Shabbat. Now, Man was to keep a Shabbat, 
Remember, in the creating of everything, Yahweh created in six days. In the seventh day, uh, some translations say he rested. What it literally means is he stopped creating, okay? And, uh, and he set apart the Sabbath. He set it apart and blessed it. He called it holy and blessed it. And so we enter into that day as holy and a blessing and blessed in that day. Well, the land itself is to observe a Shabbat. Not just in, in six days of seventh day, but after six years. Then in the seventh year is to observe a Shabbat. So what did this mean for the people living on it? When it was important that the land, that they farm the land, that the, I mean, that's how they get their food. They got to eat. They got to live. And, that's how, and then how, uh, some people, that's how they got their living. They sold the stuff. What are they going to do? Ah, now we're getting into real day-to-day -to -day life issues. Do we trust God, right? Okay, verse 3. Six years you may sow your field. For six years you may prune your vineyard and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year there is to be a Shabbat rest for the land. A Shabbat to Adonai. You are not to sow your field or prune your vineyard. You are not to reap what grows by itself during your harvest, nor gather the grapes of your untended vine. It is to be a year of Shabbat rest for the land. Whatever the Shabbat of the land produces will be food for yourself, for your servant, for your maidservant, for your hired worker, and for the outsider dwelling among you. Even for your livestock and for the animals that are in your land, all its increase will be enough food. So what he's saying, um, he's not saying you can't eat at all in the seventh year. What he's saying is you're not planting a new crop and getting that. Whatever grows by itself, you can go get it and eat, but you're not fully harvesting the field. You know what happens in that case? You're only getting what you need from the field, and so is everybody else. This is giving the opportunity for everyone to go and just take what they need, and it will be enough. See? See what's happening there? It's kind of like manna. They collected, uh, they collected whatever they needed, and in the end, it was an omer per person, and everybody had what they needed. It was enough. So, what happens if they approach this, and they're not quite sure about it? You know what happens if we say, "Well, I don't know if I can do that." So, when the time comes to plant for the seventh year. That's the time when you have to make that decision. Either you do not plant and trust Yahweh, or you plant and do not trust him. So what's going to happen? What's the result? Right? And will you have it? And if he says this is what's going to happen, and you do plant, is there going to be a blessing on that? If he says don't do it and you do it, is there going to be a blessing on that to see through? So again, there's, there's a lot to consider there. So... The question is addressed if we keep reading. Leviticus 25, verses 20 to 22. So now if you ask, what are we to eat during the seventh year? If, see, we are not to sow, nor gather in our increase. Nor, now, look at verse 21. I will command my blessing to you in the sixth year, so that it will yield a harvest sufficient for three years. So when you sow during the eighth year, you will still be eating the old stored harvest until the harvest of the ninth year comes in. See that? So you have to make that decision ahead of time. Yahweh says if you, if you, if you follow him, do these things. If you make the decision in the seventh year, we're not planting or anything. He said in the sixth year, that blessing in the sixth year that comes in will be enough between that and just whatever grows on its own will be enough for you to eat in the seventh year. And he says it's enough for three years. Well, why, why three? Because if you're not planning in, at the end of that six going into the seventh, then you're not, you know, new, no new harvest that seventh year. And then uh, when you plan in the eighth, you got to wait for that to come in. So it's actually into the ninth. See, because of that decision, that blessing in the sixth year was provision from the seventh through the eighth into the next to carry you into the next step. And this is much like we talked about in the manna, you know, in the manna, they gathered it every day. In the sixth day, there was the double the amount of manna so that in the seventh day, they did not have to go out and gather. And, and that, so there was like on Shabbat, they did not have to go out and gather because they had the provision that was the blessing that was in the sixth day. 
but the provision was there. The blessing was there, but they had to go collect it in the sixth day in faith. See that? Because what would have happened? See, they're only supposed to collect enough manna for one day, right? If they collected more than that, it rotted and got bugs and worms and smelled bad and everything else, right? So what if, just saying what if, it's like day two, and you're like, you know, I'm going to gather a bunch of this up so I don't have to worry about going out tomorrow. I want to sleep in tomorrow, so I'm just going to gather it up so I don't have to get out early and gather it. And what happens? It goes rotten, and it stinks, and there's bugs. And it's like, oh, my goodness, I'm not going to do this again. I've, that's it. I've learned my lesson. I'm only going to gather enough for one day. Six day comes along. Hey, you need to gather twice as much today. Oh, no, I'm not falling for that again. I did that, and it just it was terrible. Okay, what's the difference? <laughs> when you gathered in the, the amount you're supposed to gather the double the amount on the sixth, there was a blessing and it didn't go bad and so you had it on the seventh it comes down to obedience doesn't it are we going to just listen to yahweh he knows so are we going to do what he said and he he, he made sure and every day they had provision for that day kind of like give us this day our daily bread kind of thing and in the sixth day now gather if gather enough for today and tomorrow so that tomorrow you rest, you stop work, you cease through creating, and you rest. Again, it requires faithfulness to walk in the provision there. Okay, so back to Leviticus 25, verses 24 to 28. And all the country you possess, you shall allow a redemption of the land. So we talked about the Sabbath that the land has, and the faith it takes to do that. Now we talk about redemption of the land. What, what does that mean? Yahweh says, he owns the land. We do not own the land. He owns the land. It's his. We live there with him. It says we are sojourners with him in the land. So you don't technically own property, own land in Israel. You kind of lease it. And it was done in the 50-year increments up through the years of Jubilee. So example, if you're going to buy a farm, and, and we just had a Jubilee, and I want to buy the farm, the price reflects 50 years of, of what that farm is producing, the worth of that 50 years. If we're 40 years in, it's 10 years to the next Jubilee, I'm only going to pay for 10 years worth of that instead of the whole 50. Again, so the price is prorated according to the years and the, the worth in that time frame. Okay, so that's how it was. So this is what we're looking at, Leviticus 25. They both talk about the Redeemer, even of the land and people. So we see uh, in the six years and going into the seventh year, years of remission, years of release, debts are forgiven, this kind of thing among the people. It's kind of like a big reset. And that's an amazing thing. And then the Jubilee year was a bigger thing because not just uh, debts are released and, and these things are, are done, but all the people were to go back to the land of their inheritance, back to the land of their heritage. See, that didn't happen in the seven years. It only happened in the 50th year. So anything that was bought or sold or whatever went back to its original owners. That's something to consider as well. Okay. So with that, uh, if, if I was in a situation to where I, I got, I got myself and I didn't have the money and I needed to borrow money and I couldn't pay it back. I would put myself to work off that money for somebody else. All right. And, um, so if, if, if I was in a situation where I couldn't pay the debt, I either worked it off or I had a redeemer who would pay the debt for me. And that's where we get into issues of to be redeemed. Right. Okay. Let's, let's get into that. Leviticus 25 verses 24 to 28. And in all the country you possess, you shall allow a redemption of the land. If your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. If a man has no one to redeem it and then himself becomes prosperous and finds sufficient means to redeem it, let him calculate the years since he sold it and pay back the balance to the man to whom he sold it, and then return to his property. But if he has not sufficient means to recover it, then what he sold shall remain in the hand of the buyer until the year of Yovel, Jubilee. In the Yovel it shall be released, and he shall return to his property. Okay. Um, 
So what do we talk about a redeemer? A redeemer, a redeem is purchase. Okay, redeem means purchase. So ga'al means to redeem something, uh, to be the next of kin, right? This was like to buy back a relative's property, to marry a widow, to be an avenger of the blood, to deliver the to deliver someone in the family, uh, to purchase or to, to pay a ransom. Uh, Ge'ulah means redemption or restoring something like land or a house or a person to its proper place after it had been forfeited. Go'el is is that someone who is a redeemer, and we know Yeshua is our redeemer. Yahweh redeems his people. Uh, Yahweh said when they came out of Egypt, this was more than just rescuing them from oppression. He said, I redeemed you. He was showing the right of a redeemer, like a father even. He was showing the right of a redeemer. How does he have the right to redeem? Because we are the cra- we are uh, the, the work that he created. He is the craftsman. We are the creation. He has the right to redeem what he created. <laughs> See, we own what we create. Yahweh owns what he creates. He created you. So he has the right to redeem. Okay. So what, talk, what do we mean with the Jubilee? Well, there are some conditions implied upon it. And then Jubilee was pronounced. Uh, it was pronounced in the 49th year at Yom Kippur. And then so going into the 50th year, it was... Uh, all the people were to go back to the land, no matter where they were, no matter what was going on, all Israel, all tribes, all people returning back to the land in this grand Jubilee event, right? Which means truly Jubilee can't really happen in its fullness until all the tribes go home, which is something that we know Yeshua came to do recalling all people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, no matter where they are in the world, to come back to the land that he has said it has his name inscribed in it to a people called by his name. We see in Leviticus 25.10, you are to consecrate the 50th year, proclaiming freedom throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It will be a yovel for you. You will return everyone to the land he owns, and everyone is to return to his family. So it was believed that when the Messiah comes, he will return all people to the land and declare Jubilee. Again, Jubilee was to be declared on Yom Kippur in the 49th year, right? Yeshua declared the start of this work when he was in the synagogue and he read Isaiah 61. In Luke 4.21, it says he started to speak to them. Today, as you heard it read in this passage of the Tanakh, it was fulfilled. He is to do what? To declare this day, the year of Jubilee. Wow, amazing things. So the Messiah declares the Jubilee, right? Which means that the Messiah gathers all Israel. Messiah gathers all the people back into Israel. Again, if you want to think about uh, these pictures in the new Jerusalem, we're all going to be gathered to 12 gates, 12 tribes. I mean, we're all coming back no matter where we're from, no matter whatever, we're all coming in to be part of one people called by his name in the new Jerusalem amazing and this is what the messiah is doing uh matthew 15 24 yeshua said i was sent to the lost sheep of the house of israel romans 11 17 and 18 talks about the branches of the tree and you are grafted in the wild olive grafted into the natural olive tree Uh, leviticus 25 47 to 55 says, if a stranger or sojourner with you becomes rich, and if your brother beside him becomes poor and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner with you or to a member of a stranger's clan, then after he is sold, he may be redeemed. One of his brothers may redeem him, or his uncle or his cousin may redeem him, or a close relative from his clan may redeem him, or if he grows rich, he may redeem himself. He shall calculate with his buyer from the year when he sold himself to him until the year of Jubilee. And the price of his sale shall vary with the number of years. The time he was with his owner shall be rated as a time of a hired servant. If there are still many years left, he shall pay proportionately for his redemption some of his sale price. And if there remain but a few years until the year of Jubilee, he shall calculate and pay for his redemption in proportion to his years of service. And he shall treat him as a servant hired year by year. He shall not rule ruthlessly over him in your sight. And if he is not redeemed by these means, then he and his children with him shall be released in the year of Jubilee. So, in declaring 
the year of Jubilee. We're, we're talking about issues of the kinsman redeemer and the right of the redeemer and what that means for the people. And there's a great example of this in the Tanakh, you know, the Tanakh, the old Testament, the Torah, the prophets and the writings, um, about Ruth. Ruth is an amazing story that we read about a redeemer and showing uh, how much Yahweh does for us and just the blessing that is on all of that. So let's talk about that for a minute. Okay. So what's the deal with Ruth? We have Elimelech and Naomi, and then there was a famine in Israel. So Elimelech took his family to the fields of Moab. There, his sons marry Moabites and Elimelech and his sons, they, they all die. So Naomi hears that Yahweh has visited Israel and given them food. Remember, there was a famine, but now there's food growing back in Israel. So she took her two daughter-in-laws and told them, return to their families. Maybe they could find another husband. Orpah went. Ruth stayed. Remember, my, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God, right? So Naomi and Ruth went back to Israel. So in Ruth 1.22 so Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. When, just for the sake of saying, when is the barley harvest? April-ish, around the time of Pesach. Remember, because you have Pesach, unleavened bread, first fruits, counting the Omer, the fifty days to Shavuot, right? That's why uh, Shavuot. This is why Shavuot on Shavuot, the Book of Ruth is co commonly read over Shavuot for this reason. So, um, so this is in this time frame. So Ruth goes and she goes to glean the edges of the field. She didn't have land there. She didn't have anything she could do there. So how's she going to eat? She went to glean the edges of the field because that is a command in the Torah that is given right after talking about Shavuot. In Leviticus 23 verse 22, it says, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not make clean riddance of the corners of your field, which you reap. Neither shall you gather any gleaning of the harvest. You shall leave them to the poor and to the stranger. I am Yahweh, your God. So he's saying right after he talked about Shavuot and coming together and doing a, and make the offering to Yahweh for Shavuot. He's saying when you're, when you're gleaning in your harvest, after this new first fruits is, is, is given after you gleaning in your harvest, leave the corners and the edges of your field so that those who don't have can come get so that there's still provision in the land there, okay? So it's kind of like you're giving to the poor, the orphans, the widows, the strangers, all that. It's there, they can come get it, and they can, they can get what they need there. So Ruth was doing that. So in Ruth 2, 3, so she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. So family to Naomi, because she had married Elimelech. So Boaz asked who this woman was, and then he approached her. So Ruth 2, verses 8 through 11, Boaz says to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping, and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. And then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me, and how you left your father and mother in your native land and came to a people you did not know before. So he's saying, because of the kindness you have shown to Naomi, I want to look after you. So stick in this field. You're going to be safe here, and I've told people to look out for you, and if you need any water, they've already drawn water over there. You can go get it, and it's fine. You don't have to draw your own water. It's already there for you. Just go take it and, uh, and stick with this group, and you're going to be okay. You're going to be safe, and you're going to have what you need. Okay, so again, that, that's a big deal because, again, in a desert, you need food. You need water, right? Okay, so Boaz, after time, Boaz invites Ruth to eat with them. So he also told his young men, let her glean among the sheaves. And then he even says, actually, pull some of the bundles out for her to glean. <laughs> so let her glean from the sheaves. And actually, as you're gathering these things in together, pull some out and kind of throw it down there so that she can just pick it up. Make it easier on her, right? 
So then she gathered all this stuff and then she went back to Naomi. So uh, chapter two, verse 19 and 20. And her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today? And where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. And Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he be blessed by Yahweh, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a close relative of ours, one of our redeemers. So he was looking after her because of their relationship. Ruth 3, 10 to 13. And he said, uh, because Ruth goes to him and, and is speaking of being a redeemer, right? So he said, blessed be you, Jehovah, my daughter. You have dealt more kindly at the latter end than at the beginning. Not to go after the young men, either poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. All that you say I will do to you, for all the gate of my people know that you are an able woman. And now, surely it is true that I am a kinsman redeemer. But there are also a redeemer nearer than I. So stay tonight, and it will be in the morning. If he will redeem you, well, he will redeem. And if he does not delight to redeem you, then as Jehovah lives, then I will redeem you. So lie down until morning. So stay here and rest. You know, if you want me to be a redeemer for you, um, there's someone else who, who has the right to that first. So let me go find out about that, and then we can deal with this, all right? So Boaz goes to the gate. He waits for his brother, and Boaz asks him if he would redeem. What does redeem mean? Purchase, to buy. Purchase his brother's field. This would benefit Naomi, right? And so he said, well, okay, yeah, all right. So his brother said, yes, he would, he would purchase his brother's field. And, and yes, this would benefit Naomi. And I mean, it's, he's looking good so far, right? Then Boaz says, by the way, this deal comes with Ruth. <laughs> and, and so, well, why? Because the Redeemer was to raise up a name for his brother so that his brother's family can continue. It's called Levi right marriage, right? You may have heard of that. So he was to, to give his brother sons so that his brother could have a name in Israel and take care of the, 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 the widows. Okay, take care of the widow. So again, this was a process that uh, it continued to perpetuate the family and that like, so this family doesn't lose what was theirs and it goes to somebody else and now they're left destitute, right? And so what, what does he say? He says, no, this is too much for me. Boaz, you can do it. <laughs> and that's what happened. So understand this as well. An act of redemption gave birth to the king of Israel. What an amazing thing. That out of an act of redemption, an act of being redeemed, it, it, it brings forth the king of Israel. Oh, it, it, it's exciting. Ruth 4, 13 to 17. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went in her, and Jehovah gave her conception, and she bore a son. And the woman said to Naomi, Blessed be Jehovah, who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be called in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you has borne him, who is better to you than seven sons. And Naomi took the child, and laid him in her bosom, and became a nurse to him. Verse 17, and the neighboring women gave him a name saying, this is a son born to Naomi. And they called him Oved. And he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. What an amazing story, isn't it? Look, when Israel was taken out of Egypt, that was an act of redemption. Exodus 6 verses 6 through 8 talks about that. Yahweh is saying, that I'm bringing you out, I'm going to bring you to myself, I'm going to deliver you, and I'm going to redeem you. You will be my people. I will be your God. This is a relationship. I redeem you, and I will bring you from my possession. And in that close relationship, he is the one who has redeemed us. And understand, your Redeemer, Yeshua, Yahweh, Yeshua, your Redeemer, has that relationship with you to live in the kingdom with you. Your redeemer is not some, in order for someone to redeem you, he has to be alive. <laughs> Does that make sense? In order for someone to bring redemption to you and redeem you, he has to be living to do so. Understand your redeemer is alive. 
Job 19.25 says, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand at the latter day upon the earth. You know what that means? My Redeemer is alive and in the last day he's going to stand on the earth. And I say amen to that. Yahweh is your Redeemer. and Yeshua is your Redeemer. 1 Peter 2, 5 through 7 says, You also as living stones are being built as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Yeshua. Because of this, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion an elect precious stone, a corner foundation, and the one believing in him shall never in any way be ashamed. Quoting from Isaiah 28, 16. Continuing on, 2 Peter 2, 7, Then, to you who believe belongs the preciousness, but to disobeying ones, he is the stone which those building rejected. The one became the head of the corner, which is quoting from Psalm 118, 22. He is your redeemer. He is the rock of our salvation. And because of that, we are precious stones with him as well. Isaiah 48, 17 to 19. Thus says Yahweh, your redeemer, the holy one of Israel. I am Yahweh your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way that you should go. Oh, that you had paid attention to my commands, then your peace would have been great like a river, and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your offspring would have been like the sand, and your descendants like its grains. Their name would never be cut off or destroyed before me. Yahweh is your Redeemer. And again, Yeshua is your Redeemer. When Yeshua redeems you, you are his. John eight thirty four to 36, Yeshua says, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone practicing sin is a servant of sin. But the servant does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. Therefore, if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. No second guessing, no questions. If he has set you free, you are free. Now live this way. You are now no longer a slave to sin but you are a servant of righteousness. Shaul, the Apostle Paul, puts it this way. He's a bondservant. What does that mean? A bondservant is someone who served for six years, and in the seventh year he can go free, but he chooses not to. He says, I don't want to leave my master. I love my master and my family. I want to stay here with, with, with them. And so I surrender my life and the rest of it to serve my Lord. That's a bondservant, and that's who we are. We surrender ourselves to serve our Lord. Romans six sixteen and 19. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, that leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. And I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. You're a bondservant, so we now serve Yahweh. Look, Leviticus 25, verse 55. For it is to me that the people of Israel are servants. They are my servants who I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh, your God. The basis of everything that we do is because he is my Elohim. He is my God. Yahweh is the one that I serve. I love him. Therefore, I do things he asks. I live for him. I live for his kingdom. I live for his ways, not my own. Yeshua puts it this way, Matthew twenty-two thirty-six 36 to 40. You are to love Adonai your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The entire Torah and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Why? It's all about relationship. Relationship with Yahweh your God and relationship with his people. All about relationship. He has redeemed you. He has set you free. 
And he has called you to live as those who are free and to help show the way and build the kingdom. It's a lot to do, guys. Well, it's, um, it's, it's, it's all I've got for you this time around. There's a lot more we could talk about in here, but uh, we'll save this for another time. So I pray this has been a blessing to you. And if this has uh, blessed you, encouraged you, maybe challenged you a little bit, then share it. If it's been a blessing to you, it's going to bless somebody else too. So on whatever avenue you watch or listen, please share this to help get these out there. And if it has been a blessing to you, then please consider making a donation to help us to continue making these, putting these out, producing these, and putting them out on the different platforms that we can so that uh, other people do get to hear it. <laughs> so if it's blessed you, it's going to bless somebody else and help us to continue putting them out there. Okay? So until next time. Be blessed, be a blessing, and shalom.